Thanks, Graham. Um, let's see. Let's start with the first two slides. Great. <laughs> Okay, the paper I the lecture I'm going to give you tonight was uh, originally written for a colloquium uh, around the work of the French philosopher uh, Jacques Derrida. Uh, his work since 1980 was held at a conference center in, uh, in Normandy last July. Uh, the overarching theme of the colloquium was the notion of le, le passage des frontières, the crossing of frontiers. And that's a notion which, for that reason, turns up more than once uh, in the text I'm about to read. Um, I'm also going to be quoting uh, from a recent um, fact, book by Derrida called Memoirs of the Blind. This, was, this is a catalog text for an exhibition that he made in the uh, Cabinet de Dessin drawing room in the Louvre. And the catalog will be published in translation this spring by the University of Chicago Press. Um, the translators are Pascal and Brault and Michael Noss, and all the quotations from Derrida that I'm going to give come from their translation. I warn you in advance that Derrida is probably more complicated in English than in French. Halfway through memoirs, the, 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 this will start out with stuff from Derrida, but then it actually drifts away to talking about works of art. Halfway through memoirs of the blind, the self-portrait and other ruins. Jacques Derrida briefly considered several remarkable self-portrait drawings by the 19th century French painter Henri Fantin Latour. And this takes place in the context of a discussion of what Derrida calls the retrait transcendental du trait, the transcendental withdrawal or retreat of the trait, T-R-A-I-T. That's a basic term in his lexicon, and it carries a range of meanings from a trait or feature to a line, stroke, or mark. Very roughly, the necessity of such a retrait, such a withdrawal, follows from the inherently differential structure of the trait in Derrida's account. Because the trait, once drawn, ideally, Derrida says, has no thickness, but instead only marks the separation between the inside and the outside of the figure, the single edge of the contour, as he puts it. It is, so to speak, divided within itself. It cannot, strictly speaking, manifest itself as such. In Derrida's words, quote, nothing belongs to the trait, and thus to drawing and to the thought of drawing, not even its own traits. And he also says, the outline or tracing separates and separates itself it retraces only borderlines, intervals, a spacing grid with no possible appropriation. The experience or experimenting, this is an attempt to render the French word experience, of drawing and experimenting, as its name indicates, always consists in journeying beyond limits. At once crosses and institutes these borders, it invents the shibboleth of these passages. Don't worry about that, that's another Derrida theme. And then he goes on to say, and that transcendental retreat or withdrawal in turn, this is a long passage, calls for and forbids the self-portrait. Not that of the author and presumed signatory, but that of the source point of drawing, the eye and the finger, if you will. This point is represented and eclipsed at the same time. It lends itself to the autograph of this wink or clan d'oeil, that plunges it into the night, or rather into the time of this waning or declining day wherein the face is submerged. And the best way to take this is just look at these drawings while I'm saying, see, see if portions of this come into focus. It gets carried away, decomposes itself, or lets itself be devoured by a mouth of darkness. Certain self-portraits of Fantin Latour show this. Sometimes invisibility is shared out, if one can say this, right between the two eyes. There is, on the one hand, the monocular stare of a narcissistic cyclops, a single eye open, the right one, if you take the drawing on the left there, a single eye open, the right one, and this will be important, fixed firmly on its own image. It will not let it go, but that's because the prey necessarily eludes it, making off with the lure. The traits of a self-portrait are also those of a fascinated hunter. The staring eye always resembles an eye of the blind, sometimes the eye of the dead. 
at that precise moment when mourning begins. It is still open, a pious hand should come to close it. It would recall a portrait of the dying. Looking at itself, seeing, it also sees itself disappear right at the moment when the drawing tries desperately to recapture it. For this Cyclops eye sees nothing, nothing but an eye that it thus prevents from seeing anything at all. <coughs> seeing the seeing and not the visible, it sees nothing. This seeing eye sees itself blind. On the other hand, and this would be, as it were, the eye's nocturnal truth, the other eye is already plunged into the night, sometimes just barely hidden, veiled, withdrawn, en crecret, sometimes totally indiscernible and dissolved into a blotch, and sometimes absorbed by the shadow cast upon it by a top hat shaped like an eye shape, as in other drawings, from one blindness to the other. Derrida goes on to say that Fantan Latour's drawings epitomize what he tentatively names the hypothesis of sight, or the intuitive hypothesis, the hypothesis of intuition. Derrida's point concerns the inescapableness of hypothesizing, that is, of conjecturing, of presupposing, at the heart of the act of intuiting, that is, of seeing, as it were, immediately, without reflection, the subject of Fantan Latour's self-portrait drawings. For as Derrida remarks, we can only conjecture that the protagonist of those drawings, call him the artist model, is actually delineating his own image as he perceives it in a mirror, thereby portraying himself in the act of making his self-portrait, the one before us. In fact, we are shown neither the surface of the sheet of paper on which he is drawing, nor the mirror itself, whose presumed place we occupy, and which indeed we effectively replace and obscure, or as Derrida also says, which we make one blind to, quote, by producing, by putting to work the sought after specularity. Derrida continues, the spectator's performance, as it is essentially prescribed by the work, consists in striking the signatory blind and thus in gouging out at the same stroke the eyes of the model, or else in making him the subject at once model, signatory, and object of the work gouge out his own eyes in order both to see and to represent himself at work. If there were such a thing, the self-portrait would first consist in assigning, thus in describing, a place to the spectator, to the visitor, to the one who's seeing blinds. It would assign or describe this place following the gaze of a craftsman who, on the one hand, no longer sees himself, the mirror being necessarily replaced by the destinatory who faces him, that is, by us. We stand in for the mirror, we block the mirror, we therefore break up the relationship of the artist seeing himself in the mirror. But us who, on the other hand, at the very moment when we are instituted as spectators in the place of the mirror, no longer see the author as such, can no longer in any case identify the object, the subject, and the signatory of the self-portrait of the artist as a self-portrait, because we've broken up the presumed relationship of the artist depicting himself as seen in a mirror that we now block. <coughs> in this self-portrait of a self-portrait, the, <coughs> the figure or face of Fantin Latour, Latour should be looking at us, looking at him, according to the law of an impossible and blinding reflexivity. <coughs> In order to see himself or show himself, he should see only his two eyes, his own eyes. Two eyes that he must, however, get over mourning just as soon and precisely in order to see himself, eyes that he must just as soon replace to this end with the representation in sight and in the place of the mirror by other eyes, that by eyes that see him by our eyes. Derrida concludes further on, even if one were sure that Fantin Latour were drawing himself drawing, one would never know, observing the work alone, whether he was showing himself drawing himself or something else, or even himself as something else, as other. And he can always, in addition, draw this situation, the stealing away of what regards you, of what looks at you, of what fixedly observes you, not seeing that with which or with whom you are dealing. Does the signatory himself see that which he makes you observe? Will he have seen it in some present? And of course, I was greatly struck by Derrida's remarks when I first read them, both of them because of their characteristic subtlety, and I will say their characteristic difficulty, and because the works they treat as exemplar, Fantin Latour's self-portrait drawings were already of urgent interest to me. 
Let me say at once that the problematic I shall be exploring this evening is not the same as Derrida. I'm not concerned with a transcendental logic of drawing, and hence I shall not engage with this framing notion of the transcendental withdrawal of credit. Rather, this lecture is part of an explicitly historical project, one, however, that is not devoid of quasi-transcendental implications, a study of the advent of modernist painting in France in the crucial decade of the 1860s. The central figure in that development was, of course, Edouard Manet. Uh, but one of my basic claims in a book called Manet's Modernism, I'm Almost Done Writing, is that Manet's revolutionary achievement can be made historically intelligible only to the extent that he is seen as having belonged to a specific artistic generation, which I call the Generation of 1863 in honor of its moment of maximum visibility, the Salon des Refusés of that year. The other artists I think of as constituting that generation, along with Manet, are Fantin Latour, the expatriate American James McNeil Whistler, and a highly gifted painter and etcher who deserves to be much better known, Alphonse Le Gros, L-E-G-R-O-S. All four were born between 1832 and 1837. One reason art historians have never fully appreciated the importance of treating them together is that they cohered as a group for only a short time. In 1863, Whistler decamped to London, taking Le Gros with him, the prospects for sales, and commissions were a lot better there. And although both artists continued for a while to exhibit in Paris, the seeds of this union were sown. Within a few years, Whistler and Le Gros broke with one another, and Whistler repudiated his realist origins. Fantin, in the meanwhile, became more and more reclusive, leaving Manny alone in the public eye. Another reason why the generation of 1863 has been slighted is that it was quickly succeeded by the most long-lived and stylistically coherent generation in all of modern art, the Impressionists. Monet, its leading figure, was born in 1840. Indeed, the success of Impressionism has been so sweeping as to have largely determined our understanding of the painting immediately preceding, Manet's in particular. But I'm already straying beyond the bounds of my topic in this lecture, and maybe not. At any rate, I'm concerned with a singular moment in the history of painting in France, the moment I've said of the advent of modernist painting in the work of Manet, but also of certain other developments, largely in lesser media, that are even less well understood, involving Manet's contemporaries, Fantin Latour, Whistler, and Le Gros. The moment, in other words, is precisely one of a certain crossing of frontiers, historically from pre-modernist to modernist painting, as regards medium from painting to drawing and etching and back, and as we shall see from one mode of realism associated with Courbet to another fundamentally different mode of realism foreshadowing the Impressionists. In addition, as Derrida's observations already suggest, the works we shall be looking at raise the question of the status of the frontier, at once literal and imaginary, that separates and binds together the world of the representation and that other world, itself not simply real, that lies this side of a given work's material <coughs> surface. That's a problematic notion, as we shall see. To acknowledge the quasi-phantasmatic status of that frontier between the world of the representation and the world of this side of the world <coughs> is to concur in Derrida's insistence on the role of hypothesis or supposition in the act of seeing or intuiting and in fact, the reading of Fantin Latour's drawings I shall put forward complements Derrida's, which focuses on the artist model's gaze as it hypothetically is given, given back to itself by the action of the mirror, by calling attention to another equally important operation of that presumed mirror, as well as to certain no less hypothetical actions of the artist model's hands. In other words, Derrida is chiefly interested in the eyes. I'm going to be focusing a lot on the hands. Another area of shared concern is suggested by the emphasis we each put on a metaphor of blindness, but here I really am getting ahead of myself. In two books, Absorption and Theatricality, Painting and Beholder in the Age of Diderot, and Courbet's Realism, as well as in a whole slew of articles, I've tracked the evolution of what I call an anti-theatrical tradition within French painting from the middle of the 18th century until the advent of Manet in the first half of the 1860s. At the heart of that tradition was the requirement, first articulated theoretically by Denis Diderot in the late 1750s and 1760s, Diderot, the first great art critic, and arguably the greatest art critic in those times, that the figures in a painting, or a tableau, a notion he extended to the stage, is that the figures in a painting appear to take no more notice of the beholder than if the beholder did not exist. What this meant in practice was that the represented figures, the figures in a work of art, had to be made to appear entirely engrossed, or as I mainly say, absorbed, in their actions, feelings, and states of mind. 
figures so absorbed were felt to be oblivious to everything but the objects of their attention, including especially the beholder standing before the canvas. Should the artist fail in that endeavor, if one or more figures in a picture seemed merely to be striking an attitude or performing with a view to impressing an audience, the consequences were dire. Not only were the figures themselves seen as theatral, theatrical, a term of crushing abuse, it's a negative term, but you know, the picture as a whole was seen in those terms as theatrical and thus dismissed as a fad. In short, the representation of absorption, the figures absorbed in what they're doing, emerged as the privileged vehicle for seeking to establish the metaphysical illusion that the beholder did not exist, that there was no one standing before the canvas. It was that illusion above all that Diderot valued that he found in the painting and drama he most admired, and that successive generations of French painters tried, consciously or otherwise, to realize in their art. I'll just say parenthetically that the representation of figures completely absorbed in what they're doing is a kind of hidden motive for a tremendous amount of representational painting from the 17th century on, and that includes down to the present moment. I mean, if you go and look at the exhibition of paintings um, in the gallery just outside here, uh, you will see paintings, the matrix to which, the organization of which is entirely based on the principle that the figures in those paintings seem to be completely absorbed in what they're doing, hence unaware of the view. The most important point to grasp about the Diderotian project is that, in an obvious sense, in a certain sense, it was bound to fall short of its ultimate aim. It was bound, in a certain sense, to fail, owing to the irreconcilable conflict between the demand that the beholder be denied and what I think of as the primordial convention, almost the transcendental condition, that all paintings are made to be beheld. All paintings do, in fact, posit a few before them. Thus, I have described the succession of major figures in the anti-theatrical tradition, Breuer, David, Jericho, Domia, and Yile, as having found themselves compelled to take ever more extreme measures in the attempt to neutralize or suspend that primordial convention, to try to deny the presence of the world before the work. But to put this slightly differently, in the attempt to secure the fiction of a radical separation between the world of the painting closed in to itself and that of the beholder. Examples of such measures include Greuze's exploitation of sentimental effects as a means of immuring his dramatis personae and his ambitious genre paintings. This is in the 1760s in Africa. Jacques-Louis David's almost exactly opposite retreat from the dramatic intensity of the oath of the Horatio and death of Socrates and Brutus in his great pictures of the 1780s to a kind of suspension of action in favor of posing in the intervention of the Sabine women of 1796, and then his almost complete withdrawal from the representation of outward action and expression in the last of his ambitious history paintings, the Leonidas of Thermopylae, finished in 1814. I just have to run through this. I mean, it would take too long to show you the slides for all of these, but this is the background for understanding what's going on in the later 19th century. Then there's Jericho's astonishing conceit, implied narrative in his fantastic raft of Medusa of 1890, that if only the suffering men on the raft could succeed in attracting the attention of the minuscule ship on the far horizon, they will be rescued from being beheld by us standing before the painting, as if we are the implicit cause of their suffering. We are the source of their shipwreck. <laughs> and there's Millet's evocation in a painting like The Man with a Hoe of 1861 of the virtual extinction of consciousness after backbreaking physical labor, as if so brutalized a figure, so brutalized a peasant, couldn't be imagined to be posing for the beholder. All of these are strategies that French painting takes up in the course of the 19th century. But the very extremity of those measures, not to mention their diversity, their inconsistency with one another, militated against their lasting success any one of them should succeed in seeming to neutralize the beholder once and for all. However effective these or other paintings in the anti-theatrical tradition may have been at a particular moment and in the eyes of a specific audience, sooner or later as tastes change from the original impact of the paintings more thin, they were bound to come into conflict with the fundamental truth of their condition, at which point their attempts to deny or undo that truth lost all effectiveness, and in certain cases, whereas the genre of paintings that means Sabine's, Millet's peasant pictures in the eyes of many critics, came to appear more or less blatantly theatrical in their own way. Okay? Same 
Again and again, these paintings are trying to deny the beholder, achieve a kind of anti-theatricality, and as the truth of the fundamental presence of the beholder comes through in all of these pictures of the passage of time, they can even come to look as if they're theatrical in the worst sense, made to be beheld, appealing to the view. It's in this context that I understand the differently extreme strategy in forming the realist paintings of Gustav Courbet. A strategy not of closure, the walling out or curtaining off of the beholder standing before the picture, closure because the figure seemed completely absorbed, but something altogether different. The quasi-corporeal merger in the act of painting of the painter conceived now as the painting's first beholder or painter beholder with the painting itself. I mean, I'm making this extreme a claim. I think as Courbet is painting these pictures, it's as if his attempt is to merge physically, as it were, all but literally, with the painting that he's making. It's as if he is now defined, not just as the painter of these paintings, but as the first beholder of these paintings. And if he could literally paint himself into those pictures, he, as beholder, would no longer be standing before them. At least with respect to that beholder, that first beholder, Courbet, the painting would ideally escape beholding entirely. There would be no one before it looking on because the beholder had, who had been there was now incorporated, disseminated in the work. So, for example, in the stone break, page 149 on the left, I see the young man depicted largely from the rear and bearing a basket of stones, not simply as a figure form, metaphor form, or as personifying the painter beholder's left hand holding a power that would imagine Courbet, in fact, seated before this painting, up close to it, with his left hand holding a palette, his right hand wielding a brush. Not simply as a figure for, a metaphor for, the painter beholder's left hand holding a palette, but almost as continuous with that hand and the effort it put forth. Just as I read the older man raising a hammer, as almost continuous with the painter beholder's right hand wielding a brush with which the picture was painted. Note in this connection, so I'm seeing this as the painter's right hand, this as the painter's left hand. I'm saying, it's not just that I'm saying, look, this is like a, a symbol of it, metaphor for it. It's as if the very action of painting is, and very action and effort of holding the palette is being conveyed by these workers, as it were, painting himself into them as he makes the picture. Now, what I want you to notice is how in this account, left and right inside the painting. And I'm seeing this as the painter's left hand, this as the painter's right hand. Left and right inside the painting are congruent with, line up with, left and right outside the painting, that is to say with Courbet's left hand and Courbet's right hand. See what I mean? It's a perfect relation, a perfect alignment, perfect congruence. This is going to be important, the difference between such congruence and the opposite relation of mirror reversal the reversal of left and right that you see when you look into a mirror will be central to my analysis of Fantin Latour's drawings in a couple of minutes. Indeed, the fact that we see neither Stonebreaker's face suggests a desire on the part of the painter beholder to do everything possible to align the painting as a whole with his own bodily orientation as he faced into the canvas. I mean, it's as if Courbet's dream, impossible dream in a sense, would be to make a painting that faced wholly away from the viewer face only away from the viewer, not as a way of, as it were, turning its back on the viewer, shutting the viewer out, but because then the painting would be aligned bodily with his own body before the painting, and that would facilitate a kind of merger, a kind of collapsing of the difference between himself and the painting that he wants. Again and again and again in Courbet's paintings, there are principal figures uh, seen from the rear. It's a, it's a very significant feature of them, and it's one that by and large, I think it's fair to say, let's say, art history is not Discussed. Similarly, in Courbet's magnificent wheat series, 1854 on the right, the great trade painting that's in the Musée des Beaux Arts in Nantes, France, it's really one of the. You can't even begin to get a sense of how ravishing the color is from this slide. It's one of the astonishing paintings of the 19th century. The central kneeling figure depicted from the rear as she sips wheat onto a canvas ground floor may be read as embodying the action and orientation of the painter beholder as he deposited bits of pigment onto the stretched canvas before him. 
In other words, not just the woman, but the sifted wheat and the canvas ground floor take part in a metaphorics, or rather a metonymics of painting. The seated woman to the left, dreamily separating wheat from chaff by hand, may be read as a version of the painter beholder's left hand holding his palette, but very similar in structure, ultimately to the stone uh, breakers, while the boy peering at close range into the black interior of the, it's an object called the taha, an early machine for sifting wheat, suggests the kind of negation of beholding, undoing of beholding, that would follow from the physically impossible incorporation of the painter beholder within his painting. That is to say, if you could imagine literally moving into something like a painting, what happens is this vision itself becomes beside the point. In the kind of physical merger, you're, you're too near to vision. In this sense, there's a kind of blindness at the heart of that operation. One way of characterizing different anti-theatrical strategies pursued by Diderotian painting on the one hand and Courbet's realist canvases on the other might be to say that whereas painters in the anti-theatrical tradition before Courbet sought to make paintings that would in effect be blind to the presence before them of the beholder because the figures would be so totally absorbed in what they do that they wouldn't see the beholder. And this is why a certain thematics of blindness key to classical figures like Homer and Belisarius, who are so important to an artist like David. <coughs> Courbet's realist works evoke the blindness of the painter beholder, or if this seems too strong, they evoke a kind of eclipse of vision that physically merging with the painting before him would have entailed, which is why so many figures in Courbet's paintings, including self-portraits like the wounded man, which Derrida also mentions in, in that memoir of the blind, have their eyes closed. A very curious feature of Courbet's paintings is how often he will represent figures, including himself, with their eyes closed. I mean, think about what it would mean to, to paint a self-portrait of yourself with your eyes closed. Both blindnesses thus belong to the enterprise of painting, which raises the question of their relation to the blindness of drawings on which Derrida insists. Maybe the works we're about to examine can help clarify that point. Okay, that's what I needed to lay out for you as kind of background to what follows. Um, so needless to say, it's condensed and it's summary, but I hope it will set up a discussion that follows. The two drawings now on the screen were made around 1860 when Fantan was 24. The one on the left is executed in charcoal with stump and pencil. The one on the right in pen and black ink. Both are superb instances of the young Fantan's drawing style at its most authoritative, and both perfectly exemplify the hypothetical logic that Derrida analyzes in the passages I began by quoting. That is, both drawings convey the impression that the artist model is gazing intently at and striving to portray his own image in a mirror, an assumption which, as Derrida shows, the drawings alone are powerless to confirm or deny. Right? Looking at these, he could be drawing a rabbit. Or rather, they are powerless to confirm or deny it as a matter of immediate perception. Derrida in no way contests the assumption that that is how the drawings were made, only that the actual dynamic of their production is fully and immediately manifest in the drawings themselves. That's what he denies. I take his arguments to be irrefutable, and I want to begin my own analysis by focusing on certain features of both drawings that further exemplify the effects of the mirror, whose presence in the drawings must nevertheless remain a matter of conjecture, must remain a matter of conjecture because we aren't, in a sense, shown the mirror. <coughs> The effects I have in mind are ones of reversal of left and right. Effects Derrida brackets, doesn't deal with, when seemingly not wishing to presume the presence of the mirror before developing its hypothetical status, he describes the artist model's right eye as fixed firmly on its own image. Now, it has always been recognized that Fantan was right-handed. And yet, in the sheet on the right-hand screen, we are shown him drawing with his left hand, while in that on the left hand screen, we are shown his right hand grasping the tablet from which we presume he is drawing. For in fact, we aren't shown his left hand or the act of inscription, the act of drawing at all. This apparent reversal of left and right, from which we also deduce that it's the artist model's left eye that stares so intently from the sheet, may be taken as further, as stronger evidence of the presence of the presence of the mirror, reinforcing that of the artist's model's gaze, as well as the general mise en scène, general setup of both images. 
I need hardly add that this sort of unabashed acceptance of the effects of mirror reversal is not at all unusual in self-portraits as a genre. Though it's worth noting that Fantan's embrace of mirror reversal, he just steers right into it, introduces an aspect of irreality into works of ostensibly uncompromising realism. Fantan's a realist. I mean that the artist models ostensible fidelity to visual experience, to what he sees in the mirror before him, produces works that not only elide the presence of the mirror and allow it most partial access to the act of representation, but also exactly reverse the facts of the artist model's appearance as seen by everyone except the artist model gazing into the mirror. Put more strongly, the real, when we all experience a version of this all the time when we see a photograph of ourselves. Because right? we're so used to, insofar as we see ourselves, we're used to seeing ourselves in a mirror. And the, one, of, one source of the jolt that a photograph of us gives us is that suddenly the photograph is not mirror reversed. And so our, just all sorts of, and the, sim, the, the asymmetry is all, just, just flips. Put more strongly, the realist self-portrait, or rather what I'm going to call the visual realist, or the ocular realist self-portrait, <coughs> emerges as a contradiction in terms. For either it represents the image in the mirror, in which case it reverses the ordinary appearance of the artist model, or it reverses that reversal in the interests of a broader, impersonal, disinterested truth, in which case it's no longer faithful to what the artist model sees. Within the framework of the ocular realist project, there's no escaping this double bond. As the French philosopher Melo-Ponty observed, human beings have no direct, unmediated perception of their own faces. The ocular realist self-portrait makes that natural condition a problem for art. But at the same time as the effects of reversal confirm the still entirely hypothetical presence of the mirror, Another feature of Fantan's self-portrait drawings contests those effects by getting right and left back where they belong. What I'm referring to is the emphatically slanting hatching, a mode of shading of signifying degrees of darkness that intervenes so emphatically in both these drawings, as well as in a third drawing, pen and ink, from roughly the same moment that we'll look at in a moment. Look at shortly. For reasons that are perhaps both natural and conventional, Right-handed artists in the Western tradition have tended to hatch the shade from upper right to lower left, while left-handed artists have tended to hatch from upper left to lower right. The vigorous upper right to lower left hatching that very nearly collapses the different planes of Fantan's drawings into a single screen or grid of oblique marks may thus be read as evidence of the artist model's actual bodily orientation relative to the sheet of paper, right? He's hatching like this. That lines up with his right hand, his right left orientation as he's making the drawing, as opposed to the reversal of that orientation in the image itself. Probably other artists have made self-portrait drawings in which both components, mirror reversal and hatching that matches their own bodily orientation, can be found. I don't want to say it's unique to these drawings. But I see these particular drawings as thematizing, as emphasizing the conflict between the two with exceptional force, as conjoining, bringing together a singularly persuasive representational image with exceptionally assertive hatching, to the extent of virtually dividing the drawings from within, dividing them between the notion of mirror reversal and getting right and left aligned with the artist's body before the machine. And the question that then has to be asked is, what does that kind of internal division mean? What are the larger implications of the extreme conflict between mirror reversal and its opposite that this sort of analysis brings to life? OK, before answering that question, let me make two points. First, my discussion so far, like Derrida's in the new memoirs of the blind, but on different grounds, greatly complicates the conventional view of what may be said to lie this side of the drawing's respective surfaces. Following one line of work, let's say taking the drawings as ocular realist images, what lies there, this side of the drawing, this, more precisely what hangs or stands there facing the seated artist model, 
is a mirror. Right? For mirror reversal, it's going to be a mirror. Following another line of argument, taking the drawings as artifacts, or say as indices of their making, what is to be found this side of the drawing? Is the artist model's own right hand wielding a pencil or a piece of charcoal or a pen? And by extension, his entire body, and beyond his body, a chair, a table, a room, a space in which he sits. In short, even leaving aside the role of the viewer, a crucial and disruptive one, as Derrida has shown, there is no this side of Fanfan's drawings in any simple, unequivocal, unproblematic sense. Rather, the drawings posit an intensely conflictual and at least threefold set of hypothetical real world relationships between the embodied artist model in the act of making the drawing, the drawing itself on its block or support held by the artist model, neither vertically nor horizontally, but somewhere in between, and the mirror into which the artist model is. <coughs> Nothing less than these elements, those three elements of the artist model, the sheet of paper itself, the block, and the mirror can begin to account for the dynamic of the drawing's production insofar as the conditions of that production are taken to be represented in the drawings itself. A second point I want to stress, it's already implicit in what I've said, is that the enterprise of drawing depicted in these works is a two-handed operation. The drawings present themselves as the product not only of the actions of the artist's right hand bearing a pencil or pen, in the sheet on the left, the right hand is even shown. But also, equally important, are the actions of the left hand ripping the block. This feature of Fantan self-portrait drawings is not at all typical of the genre, self-portrait drawing. And it reveals an affinity with oil painting, which in Fantan's time, as it had for centuries, involved the right or dominant hand wielding a brush and the left or subordinate hand wielding a palette. Right? Classically, painting is a two-handed operation. In fact, I want to go further and suggest that what's at stake in the two-handedness of the act of drawing as pictured in Van Ham self-portraits is a relation not so much to painting general as specifically to Courbet. In my earlier summary of Courbet's realism, I neglected to mention the extraordinary role played in his art precisely by self-portraits. This is true both literally, self-portraits dominate his era through the 1840s, and figuratively. My reading of his art construes a number of his most ambitious canvases, including the Stone Breakers and Elite Sifters, as real allegories, at his expert, for his own term, of the activity that produced them. A major feature of the Stone Breakers and Elite Sifters, you'll remember, is that the thematization of left and right in each of them is congruent, lines up with what we imagine to have been the left right orientation of the painter beholder at work on the painting. In Courbet's self portraits proper, however, he was faced with another version of the double bind I touched on earlier. He would be faithful to what he saw in the mirror, in which case the reversal of left and right would make him a stranger to his own image. I mean, if the attempt is to merge with your own image, mirror reversal alienates you from it when you try to reproduce it in a way. Or reverse that mirror reversal so that it is his right hand, let's say, that's wielding the brush in the hand. In which case he could identify bodily with the painted image as regards the depiction of right and left, but at the cost of locating the depicted figure's right hand opposite his own left hand and vice versa, thereby disrupting the congruence of left and right, the matching of left and right, on which the whole possibility of the merger depended, as we saw. The solutions to this problem that Courbet came up with were sometimes brilliant. Here, for example, is his early self-portrait of Black Dog of 1842, in which the sitter's bodily orientation allows his right hand to be portrayed in a way that subtly suggests an analogy, not only with the orientation, but also with the activity of the paint of the holder's right hand with the brush. And he's holding a pipe just the way he would be holding a brush. And it's as if the brush is pointed into the picture, as if the hand did it in line up with his own right hand uh, over here. There's even a sense in which this scene, uh, you can see this almost as if it's a painting that he's working on. Um, as if that's a kind of landscape scene that he's been working on, and he's seated more or less working on it, and now turns for a moment and looks at us while his body still faces uh, toward it. Or again, in perhaps the most important self-portrait of the 1840s, the much darkened man with a left belt of 1845-46, 
The city's dramatically lit and sculpturally powerful right hand and wrist have been turned back into the picture space, with the result that they're now wholly congruent with what we take to have been the orientation and, in a sense, the action of the paint of the holder's right hand and arm as they are reached towards the canvas, bearing a brush loaded with paint. What I mean is, look, by turning that hand into the picture space, he's made it so that the right hand in the picture can exactly line up with his own right hand as he sits before the painting making the picture. I mean, that simple turn opens up the possibility of that alignment, that kind of relation of congruence. By the same token, the left hand, I also want to say that sense of effort that you get here is a version of the effort of painting. Uh, the left hand gripping the belt with what seems like a disproportionate amount of physical effort, what's going on there, is, I think, a version of the left hand holding the palette. But here, Courbet has been unable to get that left hand over by his own right hand. So I mean, he's able to make the, make the congruence work for his right hand, but not for the left hand. But the hands, nevertheless, represent the action of painting in this displaced form. And just to show you how difficult the project of undoing mirror reversal could be, here's a painting, his Courbet's self-portrait as a cellist, in which the oddly disturbing treatment of the actions of the cellist's right and left hand, and you notice here are the right hands, the, the right hand depressing the, the strings, and the right hands in the middle of the picture, the left hand working the bow, uh, the right hand again in the center of the picture here. I, you can, I think, feel the strangeness and awkwardness of this, and it comes from the desire to make that right hand line up with his own right hand working the picture, but then that feels very strange in, in relation to the image of the whole, as a whole and the activity of playing a cello. You feel the, the tensions in that image, and they come from the desire to make that line up with his own hand's paint. Viewed in this context, Fantan's self-portrait drawings around 1860 revealed a similar impulse on the part of the artist model. Uh, toward quasi corporeal merger with his work in progress, or at least towards the assertion of something like physical continuity between the extended act of drawing, which in these drawings largely means the act of patching the work itself. And I, I see Courbet as trying to do, Fanhan is trying to do something like what Courbet is doing, at least with respect to the hat. A feature of the second drawing that I haven't mentioned bears on this issue. This is the drawing that was on the right before. And that's the depiction in its lower left-hand corner of a partial object. Most likely the dish-like base of a small candlestick. The candle itself being just beyond the edge of the representational field. It would be the light source um, irradiating the figure of fat fat from down here. I suggest that that partial object may be seen. I mean, on the one hand, it seems like the bottom of some kind of dish holding a candle. But I want to say that it can also be seen as a really barely distorted image or perhaps <coughs> imprint of the artist model's left thumb, which if we trust the drawing as a faithful record of mirror reversal, would have gripped the sheet of paper precisely there. I mean, you see, that's his left, that's his, in the image it's his right hand. Through image reversal, one understands that it's his left hand gripping this page exactly here. So that what he's done is provide a virtual image of his own left hand holding this sheet here. I mean, and that is a further extension of the logic that would have the action from upper right to lower left also line up with his bodily orientation before the page. By the same token, the requiring a greater leap of the imagination, the largish indeterminate object that partly supports the drawing pair of blocked towards the lower right. So that means this thing. Well, what is that? It may be seen as a figure for the artist's right thumb, or indeed his entire right hand wielding the pen, or perhaps for the weight or pressure of that hand against the sheet. Uh, in a third self-portrait drawing, also of these years, one we haven't seen yet. The artist model has turned towards his left in reality, towards his right in the image. And there's nothing that can plausibly be taken as a figure for his hand or thumb unless it's the formless darkness beneath the paper on his block. But the ink bottle near the bottom of the sheet has been shown largely from above, as if to make it available for use both by the artist model in the drawing and by the artist model outside. You see what I mean? He's positioned this 
as if it were available not just for him, but for him here. And I ask you to note, too, the combination of upper right to lower left patching with horizontal patching across the table of the desktop on which the bottle rests, as if to suggest the kind of transitional zone that that, that, that is. This use of the ink bottle as a switch point between opposed but intimately related worlds, the world of the image, the world this side of the image, can plausibly be seen either as qualifying or as exacerbating our sense of the conflict between them, kind of softening it or making it worse. One other drawing of roughly this time, although not strictly a self-portrait, belongs to the three we've just examined. In a fascinating sheet in the cabinet of this end, the Louvre, Fantan is depicted what seems to be a smallish room at the top of the hat. The scene takes place at night. The room is wholly dark except for a single source of light, a candle and a small candle holder, which stands near the right-hand edge of a table or desk. It's that candle holder, in effect, I see partially represented at the lower left of the third self-portrait drawing that I've just discussed, not that one, but the second one. The ceiling toward the left slopes inward, and on the far wall, two darkish rectangles are juxtaposed. Uh, are juxtaposed with a lighter one that appears to lean against the wall rather than to be hanging on. It's impossible to say for sure what any of those rectangles represent. The larger rectangle toward the right bears an especially confusing relation to the shadows around it. But it's possible that one of them, maybe the rectangle at the lower left, is a mirror. I mean, this. Looked at closely, it gives the impression of being framed as does the larger rectangle on the wall. In addition, a large flat rectangle, something, conceivably a sheet of paper, can just be made out while on the table surface. And there are a couple of chairs, one to the left of the table and the other in front of it. Although it can't be proved that this is the room in which Fantan made the self-portrait drawings we've been, ex we've been examining, the inference that it is that room seems all but irresistible. In any case, we feel that it must have been a room just like this. Indeed, I think of this drawing as a supplement. This is a dare not to supplement all to the others. Which is to say, I think of it as both as a further amplificatory, overflowing expression of the artist model's sense of embodiedness that he's driven to sort of show the entire room in which he sits, and as an acknowledgment that the self-portrait drawings alone are powerless to convey the full bodily circumstances in which they were made. Seen in these terms, the darkness of the room, both the drawing of the room and the self-portraits, belongs on the side of the body as if the hyperbolic desire to invoke corporeal presence called for darkness as a means of minimizing eyesight in favor of an emphasis on bodily activity. Here I would remind you, if you shut your eyes, one of the things you do is tune in to bodily sensation. Here I would remind you that the presumed dates of these drawings, around 1860, puts us, if not literally on the frontier of Impressionism, at any rate within just a few years of the public debut their views of the painters who will soon become known as the Impressionists, Monet, Pizarro, Sisley, etc. And that Impressionism as an artistic movement has always been understood as valorizing, even heroizing eyesight, visual perception as such. And yet in these works, we seem still to be in the grasp of an altogether different representational regime, a bodily representational regime. Is this really the case? go back to the first OK, this brings me to the central claim of this lecture. Simply put, Fantan's self-portrait drawings are remarkable above all for the way in which they can join, bring together, two fundamentally different, even fundamentally opposed modes of realism. First, a realism of the body expressed by a variety of means and derived ultimately from, or at least consistent with the practice of Fantan's chief immediate predecessor, the self-proclaimed realist Corbett. And second, a realism of eyesight, a visual perception, what I've been calling an ocular realism, based on an ideal of exact fidelity to appearances, an ideal that in these drawings appears to have inspired, to have found expression in, masterly transcriptions of Fantan's reverse image in a mirror. What I want to stress is the coexistence in these works of the two modes of realism but also to the extent, the extent to which they define themselves against one another, and so remain distinct, separate, juxtaposed, rather than interfused. Or to interpret that mutual opposition 
diachronically, chronologically, by placing it in a strongly vectored historical narrative, what Fantan's drawings demonstrate is the emergence of an ocular perceptual realism from a corporeal bodily one. Framed in this way, the intensity of the artist model's gaze as of a fascinated hunter in Derrida's phrase suggests not only his will to record as veristically as possible the surface facts of his appearance, but also, so to speak, the gaze's own will to come clear of the body, of the depths of the body, of the body's darkness, its wideness, by fastening onto the image of the mirror. For it's precisely the logic of reversal that enables the act of seeing and of drawing exactly what one sees to declare itself as such against the background, the persistence of a bodily mode of realism, which, as in the paintings by Courbet we have looked at, rejected left-right reversal in the interests of left-right congruence, and for which, as in Courbet's art generally, the faculty of vision was in the end secondary. In fact, I want to claim that the negotiation of a crossing of frontiers between bodily and ocular realism, ultimately between Courbet's realism and that of the Impressionists, was a crucial aspect of the historical mission of Fantin's generation. The unique significance of Fantin's self-portrait drawings is that more perspicuously than any other works of their moment, they allow us to intuit, to hypothesize, if not the invisible frontier itself, at any rate, the act of passage from one side of that frontier to the other, from corporeal realism to ocular realism. OK, let me make some observations by way of concluding. One, the findings of this essay bear closely on the work of another member of the generation of 1863, and that's Whistler. An impressive painting by Whistler, The Woman in White, 1862, it's in the National Gallery in Washington, was the one unkind indubitable success of the Salon des Refugees. But Whistler, at the outset of his career, was also active as an etcher. And I want to propose the various basic differences between the first two <coughs> published sets of Whistler's etchings, the French set of 1857 58, <coughs> and the Thames set of 1859 61, exemplify the distinction between a realism of body and a realism of visual perception. So, for example, you're looking at two etchings that are both come from the French set. So, for example, the rag gathers on the left, 1858, from the French set, is full of shapes and contours that suggest, it takes you a moment to even see how to read that image, right, before you sort of realize that those are rags hanging in a doorway, a figure in a veil uh, beyond it. It's full of shapes and contours that suggest organic form to the extent of verging on outright anthropomorphism. This is evident in the treatment of the doorway hung with rags, the crumbling plastic hints at the yieldingness of flesh, particular configurations of both human faces, organs, body parts. Indeed, so intense are these effects that the image as a whole assumes the character has a single internal corporeal space, kind of bodily cabin, in relation to which the act of seeing narrowly defines and comes to seem almost beside the point. Much the same might be said about a more important etch, the old rag woman in 1858 on the right, which also includes conspicuous traces. Can you see them? Of Whistler's fingerprints and palm prints. These dirty marks along the edge of the plate, down at the bottom, are fingerprints and palm prints um, <coughs> that Whistler left, uh, obviously, in the edge plate by, by manipulating them. Um, he left the impressions in the uh, coating, and then when the plate was put in the acid bath, the acid ate through the coating. It ate through all the quicker where these palm prints and fingerprints had been left, so that you get that in the plate itself. Uh, this is a phenomenon, you know this, called foul biting. Uh, it's something that the artist can, let's say, avoid in the first place or remove once it's there. Whistler obviously chose not to remove it. The art, official art historical reason for this is that you find that sometimes in Rembrandt's uh, etchings, and Whistler loved Rembrandt, so that's why they're there. That doesn't strike me as a sufficient um, account. In the context of the present argument, and I ask you to think of the, what I, the virtual thumbprint in the lower left-hand corner of the second Fantan self-portrait, these fingerprints and thumbprints seem further evidence of something like bodily continuity between the etchings and the etcher, between Whistler and these etchings he's making. 
I mean, he's found a way to actually put his fingerprints and contracts in the plane. I mean, so they, which, they're the same as his hands in that sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's continuous uh, with him, as if a print like that were a body part in its own right. I'm more so the whistler, French, so to speak. Something altogether different is at stake. I mean, look how fast his art changes, right? From 1858 to 1859. Is at stake in the etchings of the Thames set. Take, for example, two of the finest of those etchings, Eagle Wharf on the left, 1859, and Black Moran Wharf on the right. Both insist on the clear separation of spatial planes on a sharpness and minuteness of detail in middle and far distance that suggests the view through a telescope or a pair of binoculars. Above all, they insist on the unflagging precision of a line or trait whose plainly volitional, willed character, intended character, is at the farthest pole from the automatistic, in that sense, somatic, wandering line of the French set. Moreover, the diffuse, evenly distributed white draws our attention to the blankness and integrity of the sheet of paper. Whereas the etchings of the French set, as we just saw, seem to allude back, one might almost say to regress, to the working of the metal plate and its immersion in an acid bath, i.e. to the etching's bodily origins. I mean, an etching can direct your attention to the sheet of paper itself as an end product, or make you conscious of the process and even of the plate and even of the acid bath. And I'm saying, in these, the focus is all on the sheet of paper. All of these points are driven home by the legibility, and you see it of the little signs and lettering um, on, the, on the different house fronts uh, in these etchings. They, they nail down the primacy of the sheet of paper as opposed to the plate. You don't have to think back in inscribing those letters in reverse on the plate. And, ignore, and, it, and it's not irrelevant either that the figures in the foreground of the Thames set etchings tend to appear aware of the artist's viewer. This too is a distancing device in contrast with kind of some landalistic absorption of the old woman uh, in the earlier etching. Um, students of which have long been aware of the stylistic disparity between the French and the Thames sets, but they failed to grasp what lay beyond that disparity, which can't be understood merely stylistically. I mean, simply to say his style changed. Right? But together, it just doesn't have a kind of very powerful view. One more early work by this one is relevant to these <coughs> issues. In Beckett the Fiddle, a dry point of 1859-60, Whistler has depicted a French musician friend playing a sort of cello, and has almost completely omitted the cellist's hands, as well as the cello itself. In my brief discussion of Courbet's self-portrait as a cellist for 15 years before, I noted the difficulty he had in correlating the player's right and left hands with his own right and left hands wielding a brush and <coughs> palette. Something not wholly dissimilar takes place here. It's as though Whistler sought to identify his own action of marking the metal plate with the represented action of playing the cello, but found himself prevented from doing so, blocked from taking up the corporeal realist mode such an identification would have involved, either because the image as a whole belonged to an ocular, not corporeal register, or because the sheer difference, for example, of scale between playing a cello and incising a plate was too stark for such an act of identification to succeed. At any rate, the violent scoring of the plate to the left and right of the seated musician. I mean, he can't do the cello, he can't do the hands, but he can do that. suggests a kind of displacement of representational energies and perhaps also feelings of frustration and an experience of blockage the artist cannot fully have understood. Significantly, however, Whistler not only didn't discard Beckett the Fiddler, he actually included it in the ten set. Right? Perhaps recognizing that the kind of breakdown of representation at its center was no ordinary thing. Okay, two. As to Alphonse Le Gros, who I mentioned at the outset, an artist who has yet to receive his due, one work in particular is emblematic of the issues I've been tracing. This is a little etching called Miss Bain, the Meal of the Dinner, made between 1858 and 1860. And in it, Le Gros has depicted four figures in what seems to be an extremely modest interior dining around a small round table illuminated by a candle. Two of the seated figures are men, each is absorbed in eating, 
He wanted the left cutting something on his plate, he wanted to the right either lifting a bowl to his lips or setting it down. The seated figure in the left foreground may well be a woman. We see her mainly from the rear and no more than glimpse her profile get the lost profile. Beyond the man at the right, and looking directly at the view of a kind of snapshot effect, is a standing woman. A standing woman who seems to pause in the act of placing a small dish on the table. Though here too it's possible she's removing it. But there's a fifth personage who's indicated by the image as well. Uh, I mean whoever is meant to sit at the place that has been laid in the center foreground. A place whose orientation into the space of the image is comparable with that of the artist and viewer. You see, it's a plate, uh, fork, and a spoon. The place has been set for someone here. In fact, the implication is strong that the place in the foreground has been set for the artist, for Le Gros, who thereby posits himself in a Courbet-like relation to the etching as a whole, i.e. continuous with it, entering and in fact completing it. And somewhere in the background to this print is Courbet's great after dinner at Ornan of 1849. And hovering out there in its future is Claude Monet's superb painting Le Béjeuner in Frankfurt of 1868. At the same time, the outward gaze of the standing woman posits a more distance, in the terminology of this essay, a more visual or ocular relation to the image. While the quiet absorption of the other figures in Emile suggests the obliviousness to being beheld that I've associated with the Diderotian tradition and its classic form. Le Gros' seemingly unambitious etching thereby provides a kind of summa of relational possibilities, past, present, and to come, with respect to the beholder, though perhaps the chronological dimension of this image is less important than the fact of the coexistence of all those possibilities in a single work. Finally, Le Soubet implicitly figures, implicitly depicts the enterprise of etching in terms of the activity of eating. I mean, I want to say there's like an analogy between imagining Le Gros sitting and working this plate right, and the plate, actually the same word, on the table with implements there and what the very even scale of the activity of eating. As if the modest scale of etching in general, and this etching in particular, thematizes the virtual continuity between work and artist in corporeal realism of books as physically, I mean, presents, presents that continuity here as physically incorporating or ingesting a work of art, as if, as if what continuity here means is something like eating. Here it may not be irrelevant that the production of an etching involves a stage when the line is eaten, bitten by acid. But this in turn implies a considerable restriction of ambition in comparison with Corbet's monumental realist canvases the late 1840s and 50s, in which the literally unrealizable project of incorporation, painted into painting, is vectored the other way. And I'm saying that it's as if in a work like this, instead of artists into the work, it's also as if through the metaphor of eating, it's as if the work could be taken into the artist. But that's a smaller scale operation, so to speak. Equally extreme, but smaller scale. This, that is to say, it implies a considerable restriction of ambition in comparison with Courbet's paintings. A comparable restriction of ambition marks Van and self-portrait drawings and Whistler's French set etchings compared to Courbet. And it may be that that narrowing down, that self-limitation of corporeal realism to the confines of the artist's body, made possible or indeed necessary the emergence of an ocular realism that in the next generation would flower in impressions. As if the corporeal the scale of corporeal realism had finally shrunk to the, to the body itself. Three, although I've come close to saying that the advent of impressionism in the 1870s marked the full emergence, I'm getting near the end, marked the full emergence of ocula as opposed to corporeal realism. With impressionism, you get full blown ocular realism. I also want to stress that a certain relation to the body persisted within and beyond impressionism which is to say that the opposition between the two modes of realism was not and could not have been absolute. Vision itself is a bodily faculty, a bodily function, as Merleau-Ponty never ceases to remind us. Among the impressions, the implied presence of the body is most evident in the work of Camille Pizarro, who in pictures like The Road to Boudicien, 1870 on the left, and the farm of the Hermitage in Pontoise, 1873 on the right, apprehends his motif, and you feel this as if from the rear. 
More precisely, I see Pizarro as often having sought out views of the world, the French term was este, este, that would allow him to establish relations of congruence, of matching, not facing, between himself as embodied perceiver and the motifs that offered themselves to him to be painted. I mean, again and again, it's as if you see scenes in Pizarro. The scenes he chooses are scenes where it's as if you're shown the rear of something. The whole town is sort of like the other side of the hill. As if, and as if he loves that sense of finding a scene that's aligned with his own bodily presence, congruent with it. Monet, on the contrary, is much more likely to show you something that's splayed out before. I present it to your view. Finally, all this is to have said nothing directly about Manet, who from the start maintained a greater distance from Courbet's example than Fantin and Lebrun, well, perhaps Whistler as well. But the crossing of frontiers from a corporeal to an ocular realism that this lecture has brought to light constitutes a new framework within which Manet's revolutionary achievement will need to be restored. One work by Manet that invites being seen in these terms is his great self-portrait with power, 1878-79 which, although lying outside the time frame of the rest of this talk, is worth pausing over for just a second this is the end. In it, the right-handed painter has represented himself with right and left hands reversed, no doubt because he relied on an image of himself in a mirror. But the overall effect of Manet's canvas differs sharply from that of Fantin's self-portrait drawing. Instead of the opposition that we noted in the drawings between the exact portrayal of what the artist model saw in a mirror in which the hand is, as it were, completely subordinated to the eye. And the act of upper right to lower left hatching, in which the orientation and, in a certain sense, the reality of the artist model's body are brought into play. In man and self-portrait, a primary commitment to a certain speed, both of seeing and of execution, places eye and body, or at least eye and hand, on the same side of the painting, on this side, so to speak. More precisely, the implied fiction of the self-portrait with pattern is that Manet no sooner glimpsed his reversed image in a mirror than he rendered it in paint by the virtuo virtuoso action of his hand in brush, as though undoing the effects of mere reversal would have required more time than was available to him. The extremely summary nature of the painted Manet's left, the actual Manet's right hand, Contributes, uh, contributes to that effect by intimating that being in rapid, ceaseless motion, the hand could not properly be captured in pain, or say, being everywhere at once, it couldn't be fixed in place. Here, too, it may seem that the mutual alignment of eye and body takes place on primarily visual grounds, not as in Pizarro those of the view, but rather those of the glance, the coup d'oeil, the instantaneousness of seeing at its most unimpeded. But Manny's deep interest in instantaneousness as a marker of the encounter, the relation of mutual facing between painting and beholder, also between painter and model, was a decisive feature of his art from the beginning. And it is surely simplistic to think of that interest in instantaneousness itself as essentially visual. You know, I think that makes it too simple. In any case, the self-portrait of palette engages head-on the issues we've been tracing, even as it complicates those issues in ways that are altogether characteristic of the man who made it. Thanks a lot for your attention.